How to read and understand a scientific article. To form a truly educated opinion on a scientific subject, you need to be familiar with current research in the field. To be able to distinguish between good and bad interpretations of research, you'll have to be willing and able to read the prime research literature for yourself. Reading and understanding papers, research papers, is a skill that every doctor, every physicist, every scientist has had to learn during graduate school. You can learn it too. too. Um, you don't have to wait till graduate school to learn it. But like any skill, it takes a bit of patience and a bit of practice. Okay, reading a scientific paper is a completely different process from reading an article about science in a blog or in a newspaper or in any of the assigned essays I've been um, giving you guys each week so far. Not only do you read the sections in a different order than they're presented, but you'll also need to take notes probably um, in the document itself or on a separate sheet of paper. Um, you'll likely need to read it multiple times and you'll probably go look above probably go look up other papers in order to understand some of the details of the paper in question. So reading a single paper might take you a bit of a, you know, might take you some time, um, but be patient. And as you practice this, as you um, go through this experience, get a little bit easier. The type of scientific scientific paper that I'm discussing here primarily um, is referred to as a primary research article. So that's where the scientists are performing the, um, the research, they're performing the experiments firsthand. They're not writing about somebody else who has done the research. Okay, so um, a primary research article. It's a peer-reviewed report of new research on a specific question, or sometimes questions. And most articles will be divided into the following sections. And we're going to go through these um, in there. Each will have a slide, essentially. So you've got the abstract. You have an introduction, methods, results, and then a conclusions or interpretations or discussion section, or sometimes all three. The articles that you'll be able to choose from for our academic popular translation are examples of these. So that's our third paper. That's not due until um, October. Um, but as I've mentioned, reading a scientific paper can take a while and it can take some practice. So that's why we're starting our practice early um, with the reading uh, for this week. Okay. So before you read, make sure to take note of authors and their institutional affiliation. So what university are, there, are they um, connected with? Are they connected with, you know, a big tobacco company, Philip Morris or something? Does that um, affect maybe what they're saying? So think about that. Also take note of the journal in which, it, which it's published. Some institutions, for example, University of Texas, are well respected while others may appear to be legitimate research institutions, but are actually agenda driven. So a tip for this, um, Google Discovery Institute to see why you don't want to use it as a scientific authority on evolutionary theory. Um, check it out if you want to. Uh, be cautious of articles from questionable journals or sites that might resemble peer reviewed scientific journals, but aren't. Um, for example, Natural News is one of these. Um, there are a number of what they call open source journals now on the internet, and they will look very peer reviewed, but aren't always. That's why I suggest that you use um, the library, the UAF Rasmussen Library, and then use my uh, the short video I recorded showing you how to um, find those peer reviewed sources. I believe that's in the resources and readings section. Okay. So we're going to go step by step um, how one should read a primary research article. So when you find when you get a research article, maybe you want to check out the gravitational waves research article from this week's um, lessons, but you'll see that it usually starts with the abstract. 
Um, this is a little bit misleading. We don't generally want to start by reading the abstract because it gives you kind of the whole overview of the paper, um, including the conclusions. So it makes it a bit difficult if you're trying to um, if you're trying to understand kind of step by step the processes that the in the um, the authors of the paper are going through. Um, you actually want to begin by reading the introduction. So the, um, okay, hold on, I lost my notes, my, my spot. Um, okay, the abstract, like I said, will be the first paragraph. It's usually pretty dense, it's at the beginning. Um, often this is the part of the paper that many non-scientists read when they're trying to build a scientific argument. But it's, as I mentioned before, it's not a great practice. Um, usually re read the abstract last because it contains the succinct summary of the entire paper. And I'm concerned about inadvertently becoming biased by the author's interpretation of the results rather than your own interpretation of the results. Okay, so number two. As you're reading, you're, you're going through that introduction, and this is something you might want to write down in the margin of the paper or on a separate sheet, but try to identify the big question. What is this, not what is this paper about, but what is what problem is this entire field trying to solve? This will help you focus on why research like this is being done, why research, um, uh, why people are interested in this research now. And when you're doing this, when you're looking for the big question, when you're looking about the kind of the overview, this is another great place to look closely for evidence of agenda motivated research. Um, again, you're just really trying to uh, evaluate sources as you go. So you've read the introduction, you've identified some a big question, and now you're ready to summarize the background in about five sentences or less. Um, so things like what work has been done before in this field to answer the big question, the big question that you just um, noted in step two, okay? What are the limitations of the work in question? Um, did they have a big enough sample size? Did they, you know, um, observe their subjects over a long enough time? Um, all of these different things you're going to want to uh, think about. You'll need to be able to succinctly explain why this research has been done in order to understand it. All right, step four, you want to identify the specific question. So you've got a big question, and within that big question, there are often smaller questions. Um, what exactly are the authors trying to answer with their research? There may be multiple questions. There might just be one, but write them down again in the marginalia paper or on that extra scrap sheet. Um, but if it's the kind of research that tests one or more, more null hypotheses, you'll definitely want to identify those as well. Okay. So we've read the introduction. We've got a couple of big questions um, down or at least one we are able to summarize the background in five sentences or less. We're then narrowing down to specific questions that the authors are talking about. Then we move on to step five. This is where you identify the approach of what the authors are doing. What are the authors going to do to answer their specific questions? So this could be an experiment they're pro uh, planning. This could be um, uh, maybe they're measuring data from other collected results from um, across a certain field. Um, again, write something down about this. This will help you um, later on when you're going in and actually using that, uh, especially when we get to um, our popular, to, sorry, our academic to popular translation down the road. Number six, 
then you're going to want to go ahead and read the methods section. So this is telling you, this is telling the readers exactly what the um, scientists or the authors did with their experiment. Um, sometimes it helps if you draw a diagram for each experiment. This can help you visualize what their uh, what the authors are have done. Um, sometimes there there already are. Um, figures or diagrams either in the text of the article or in the appendices of the back. Um, those can also help understand math, um, help readers understand the methods. So spend some time um, with those as well. Include as much detail if you're drawing your own diagrams as you need um, or even modify theirs just so that you have, um, you've got your understanding of a big question, you've got your summary of background, and you have another uh, visual representation also of what the methods um, are saying. So that's just a suggestion. I, I tend to be a mixed learner, like I do well um, auditory learning, but um, when I put it into, when I start drawing it and get that kinetic learning as well, it really helps me to um, to learn it, to really fully understand. So maybe you'll take that suggestion, maybe it won't work for you. But in any case, um, step seven. So now you're gonna read the results section. So we've taken a few steps, um, we're ready to read the results. You'll often find that these are summarized into figures or tables. So you've already created one to show what your understanding is or looked at theirs to help your understanding. So make sure now to go back in, look at all those figures and tables, pay careful attention to them, um, analyze whether or not you think that those figures and tables uh, align with the text of the paper. Um, they, they usually do, but they don't always. Um, that could be um, something you talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it could be something that, how do I say this? Um, sometimes when you're using uh, academic sources or scientific uh, papers, you know, the science is, um, huh, okay, sorry, I'm losing my train. I think I'm going to think about it a little bit more and then uh, say what I was gonna say to you guys in a second. So let's move on. Um, we're going to go to, well, this is still seven, still step, step seven, excuse me. <clears throat> um, when you're in step seven, there are a few things you should pay um, closer attention to. Um, the words significant and non-significant, for exa example, have precise statistical meanings. Um, look that up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, looking at their graphs, are there any error bars? For certain types of studies, a lack of confidence intervals is a major red flag. So think about what you've learned in some of your science classes. Um, think about when you've come across these types of graphs or words before and um, really evaluate how that affects uh, the information that you're reading. Um, just because this is studied, uh, just because a paper is published and peer reviewed, doesn't mean that a reader or an undergrad reader or a graduate student reader can't pick out errors or can't pick out ways in which they disagree. Um, sometimes when you find those errors or find those ways in which you disagree with an author, that's a really ex entrance into talking about a, um, a debatable topic because then you already have a credible source um, saying something in a discourse of the field that you could that you can easily jump in and add to. Okay, so let's finish this slide. Um, also, pay attention to sample size. Has the study been conducted on ten people or ten thousand people? For some research purposes, ten people is fine, but for most studies, larger is better. All right. So moving on. So step eight. Determine whether the results. <clears throat> answer the specific question or questions. What do you think they mean? 
don't move on don't move on until you've thought about this so this is why i'm saying don't read the abstract first because then you won't be able to make these um, value judgments yourself so what do you think they mean don't move on on until you've thought about this it's okay to change your mind in light of the author's interpretation in fact you probably will if you're still a beginner at this kind of um, analysis but it's a really good habit to form um, to start making your own interpretations before you read those of others. Number nine. <clears throat> okay, so we're winding down here. Um, number nine, read the conclusion discussion interpretation section. What do the authors think the results mean? Do you, do you agree with them? Again, there's that really interesting way um, if you don't agree with them, you can say uh, Smith and Banner uh, put out this um, essay and they propose blank, you know, this argument. And then you could say, but this argument is incorrect because of, and then put your input in. Um, that's a very common way of getting into an academic discourse or into a field discourse. Um, by engaging with somebody that's already in that field, already within that discourse. Um, can you come up with alternative ways of interpreting the, the results? Do the authors identify any weaknesses in their own study? I find really particularly interesting um, feature of um, a study is when they can kind of reflect back and um, share perhaps what weaknesses were or maybe what they would have done or maybe what they would do differently in the future. Um, those are really telling um, tidbits. Do you see anything that the authors have missed? Don't assume them. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a writer, not a speaker. Sorry if I'm tripping over my words. <laughs> but don't assume that your authors that you're reading are infallible. You know, they're people too. They go through all of these processes just like we do, and they can be wrong. Um, but that's, that's, I just, I don't know. I find that that's something that I necessarily taught as an undergrad, but I think it's an important um, concept. Okay, so you're still in the conclusion discussion interpretation section. Um, do they offer a proposal? Do your authors offer a proposal as to their next step? And do you do do you agree with it? So this this step is a lot of evaluation, a lot of reflection, all of that. And then finally, we're going to be on step ten, and you're going to go all the way back to the beginning, and you're going to read that dense little paragraph at the beginning, the abstract. Okay. Um, when you do think about this, does it match? Does the abstract match what the authors said in the paper? And also, does it fit with your interpretation of the paper? And then finally, um, and I find that this is a, a especially important step these days when we kind of live in a time of uncertainty. Uh, especially regarding media. I'm not talking about like news media. I'm talking about media in general, like um, the medium of television, the medium of, uh, I feel like even um, ac academic journals, uh, tr the truth, <laughs> the truth behind them, the, the, the idea of truth in general is kind of being eroded. So something to do um, in that, in the face of that challenge is to kind of find out what consensus say, find out what other researchers say about the paper. Okay, who are the acknowledged um, experts in this particular field? Do they agree? Do they, do they not agree? Do they have criticisms of the study that you haven't thought of or do they generally support it? Um, this way you can find outliers. Um, uh, outliers that don't fit in with the consensus. And again, um, that's something to do uh, through your evaluation processes. Don't don't neglect this part. I think it's pretty important. Um, some, 
Uh, this is a section where I recommend you use Google or even Google Scholar um, to find out what other researchers are saying. If you go to Google Scholar, um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google Scholar is an excellent resource. Just in your Google search bar, just put Google Scholar and then hit enter and it'll take you to this amazing repository of all sorts of um, articles, scientific articles and all sorts of articles really. Um, and in those, in those listings in Google um, Scholar, they actually show you how many times each of the papers in question uh, have been cited by other authors that have also been published. So if you see a, a source in Google Scholar where it's been cited 350 times, and you see a very similar source that has not been cited at all, or maybe just three or four times, um, depending on other factors, of course, if something was maybe a newer publication that might not have time to have been cited, but it's a um, it's an indication that uh, one is perhaps a more credible or more um, uh, timely to the current conversation in that field. But anyway, um, do this section, do this step last um, and you will be better prepared to think critically about what other people are saying, even in uh, scientific writing. Okay, well that pretty much um, brings us to the end of this slide. If you have any questions, you can always email me.